Today we're going to be talking about building a culture. A culture is so preeminent. And if you don't intentionally decide on what that culture is going to be, and if you leave it up to chance, you're only going to grow weeds. And the rest of your life you'll be spending pulling out weeds in your marriage, in the church, in your business. I'm going to talk about a story, uh, tell a story about Anna and me going to the Grand Ole Opry. I love country music, but I have to admit that some of the lyrics in country music are so dumb. <laughs> I mean, I tell you, I'm, I'm going to read some of them to you, but I, I, I thought it was, it was fake, but these are real. Listen to some of these. I think the, the lyric writers got bored, so they had to think up something but listen to this. I think this guy was trying to be encouraging as well as honest about his girlfriend. And here's the lyric. Her teeth were stained, but her heart was pure. <laughs> Here, the Dennis Walker band. If my nose were full of nickels, I'd blow it all on you. <laughs> Is that romantic or what? Charlie Parker. I wouldn't take her to a dog fight because I'm afraid she'd win. <laughs> no comment on that one. And you've heard of Loretta Lynn? She sings this. I guess she and her husband are having a spat. And she sings this. You're the reason our kids are so ugly. <laughs> this is real stuff. I, think, I don't think their relationship lasted. And this guy must have been looking at Clearacell or something for his acne because he writes, they may put me in prison, but they can't stop my face from breaking out. <laughs> and my favorite Christian hymn of all time, Bobby Bear, drop kick me Jesus through the goalposts of life. <laughs> Doesn't that make you want to worship? <laughs> Someone asked, what do you do? What do you get when you play a country song backwards? You get your wife back, your dog back, your pickup back, your rifle back. <laughs> Country music. I was speaking in Nashville, so I thought I'd go to the Grand Ole Opry with Anna and do the whole nine yards. I mean, we'd stay at the Grand Ole Opry Hotel. The Grand Ole Opry Hotel. When you're talking country, you have to say hotel. You can't say hotel. It's a hotel. And so we got off the plane, and when we got out of the airport, I mean to tell you, it was 105 plus degrees, sweltering heat. I thought they faked us and took us to the Sahara and dropped us off. But finally, after getting out of that heat, we finally got to the Grand Ole Opry Hotel. Let me tell you, when you go inside, it's air conditioned, massive, five acres under roof. Five acres. The flora and fauna is that of Hawaii. There's waterfalls, water. People are in boats and stuff. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. Now, if you go outside, it's like on Thanksgiving, you're opening the oven, checking on your turkey. It's just like, whoo, no eyebrows left. But you go back in, and it's just like, this is beautiful. I was walking through this place, and I told my wife, I said, honey, this is new hope. She said, no, baby, you must be dehydrated. You've been standing in the sun too long. This is a Grand Ole Opry Hotel. I said, no, 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 no. This is like New Hope should be. You, you see, outside things are dying. Inside they're thriving. Outside it's frying. On the inside it's Hawaiian. I mean, I, I try to be a rapper, you know, but my... My rhyming just ain't climbing. I'm out of step with my timing. I should have found a Jawaiian who knows more about flying than me. Because if you're rapping, it's got to happen. There can't be no napping. But if you please excuse me because I'm Portuguese, so you just got to fly with me. However, time is a burning. So let's get back to the sermon because our hearts are yearning for the one we call Jesus. Peace out. I made that one up myself, can you tell? Uh, yeah, yeah. But inside, it was just gorgeous. And I thought, this is new hope because outside, people's lives are messed up. But when they come in, it's refreshing. And I thought, that's the church. Because no matter what the world is doing, what's happening in the world, when people come into the embrace of the kingdom of God, everything changes. So we don't need to fret on what's going on on the outside 
We get to rejoice in what's going on on the inside. There's something about that. The kingdom of heaven. No matter what's going on on the outside. I believe inside of everybody is a calling with a future that God implanted inside of you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says that. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. They're not plans for your calamity or, or bad stuff, but for your future and welfare that you might have hope. And I thought God's planted that in everybody's heart. But because we're outside in the sweltering heat and the brutal culture, it just doesn't come alive. It was some years ago that they exhumed a man that had died in the Austrian Alps 3,000 years ago, frozen in the ice. They exhumed this guy. They call him the Ice Man. You can look it up. But when they checked on the contents of his stomach, they found some seeds that he had just ingested before he expired. Now, check this out. They actually planted those seeds and they grew. 3,000 years old. But that's nothing compared to what National Geographic just shared, and that is that they found a squirrel frozen in the ice in the suburban, uh, in the area up, up north, and they exhumed some seeds. It's come from the Silene Stenophilia group. It's called Cambia. But they plant 32,000 years old, planted it, and if you'd show that picture, it's actually a flowering plant. And that's the seeds, 32,000 years old. So you think, what, what did they do? Did they transplant life into that dead seed? Did, did they transfer life into that? No, life was already in those seeds, even after so long. But it was latent, it was dormant, it was waiting. Potentially there, but waiting. For what? For it to have the soil necessary for that to come to life. You see, they didn't change the seed. They just changed the environment in which the seed was placed. They changed the culture around it. They didn't infuse life. No, it was dormant. It was latent. It was waiting. It was suspended, but not hopeless. It was in there. It wasn't dead. It wasn't finished. It wasn't deceased. It was waiting. If you think about the parable of the sower and the seed in Matthew 13, remember the farmer goes out and sows seed. Some fell on the path, some on rocky ground, weedy ground, and some on good soil. The others died, but the one on good soil bore fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. Now you take a look at that seed. Was it a different seed than the other? Was it a different variety of seed than the other seed? All the seed had potential to be giving forth 30, 60, 100 fold fruit and harvest. But only this much did. Why? Not because of the seed. Was it the farmer? No, it wasn't because of the farmer. It was because of the soil into which it was sown. The culture was different from this one and this one and this one. And I thought, Lord, that's so true about the church. And as we approach our first anniversary, I thought we want to ensure a solid culture. Because God's going to bring people here from that, that have been frozen in the past. Frozen because of a past event. Frozen in their potential because of a past hurt. Maybe their personality is sort of underground, keeps them underground. And although we can't turn back the clock, we can build a culture where people have an opportunity to thrive. Every church has a culture. It may not be the culture we want, but every church will have a culture. Every family has a culture. It may not be the culture you want, but you have a culture. It could be a culture that's legalistic, maybe boring. It could be a culture that is harsh, authoritarian, stodgy. Or it could have a culture that's grace-filled, wise, fun, belonging, a place called home. Either one, but you have to choose. If you just let it happen, your family, your marriage, the church, if you just let it happen, it's kind of like taking a plot of ground and just fertilizing it and watering it. Just fertilize it and water it. If you just fertilize, fertilize with miracle grow, it ain't going to come out mir miraculous, let me tell you. If you just put on miracle grow and water it, what's it going to sprout? 
weeds, like steroid weeds. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be gargantuan weeds. And every week you're going to be what? Pulling weeds, yeah. If you want a, an orange grove, you have to make sure that the only seeds in there are what kind of seeds? Orange seeds. And whatever is not orange, you take out. And then you end up with an orange grove. But you better plan it that way. We can't just hope it happens and keep watering it. Because that's why a lot of our lives, we spend most of our time pulling weeds out of our marriage, out of our lives. Because we haven't decided on the culture. We say, well, Wayne, how do you build a kingdom kind of culture? One that will allow life to emerge, even though if it was frozen in the past or held hostage by a past event or, or something of a habit that just held them back. How do we build a culture that allows that to change and, and good stuff to grow? You know, fortunately, we're not stuck with the soil that you're in right now. Because some people say, well, the culture of my home or my marriage isn't that good. We, we have some underlying issues and there's always an anger, a spirit of, of distrust. Yeah, that's a culture. You have to change that, don't you? Yeah, how, do, how in the world do you do that? Well, first of all, you're not stuck with that culture. Just like any kind of plant that, or area in a garden, you can amend the soil. You can change that. You can till it up. And sometimes God will, by his spirit, till up your life before he changes and amends the soil. So don't be afraid when the Holy Spirit comes with his plow. And I would encourage you to just say to the Holy Spirit, Lord, would you just drive your plow right through here and till it up? Because I know you want something good, but it ain't going to happen if it's a hardened heart. And so that's why the book of Isaiah, Isaiah says, the Lord is going to come and break up the fallow ground. So he's going to drive the plow through you for a season. It ain't going to be fun. But always know that whatever God does is because he loves you and has a plan for your future and your hope. So he's going to run that plow through. And you can amend that soil and he can place good things in it so it grows. David, who was king in the Old Testament, prior to him being king, he was a fugitive of King Saul. Do you remember that? King Saul wanted to kill him because he was threatened by the fact that David might take over the throne. So his plan was to eradicate David. So David was running like a fugitive. Now, his first staff, as he's building his army, wasn't stellar staff people. It didn't come from ABC Staffing Company. These people that came were losers. In fact, Let's read about the character. It's in your notes, so if you would take out your notes and write at the top, let's read about this who was a master at building the right culture. Even though he started with bad soil, he was a master at building the right culture. And if David can do it, we can too. Let's read what it says about the caliber of his staff. Are you ready? Go. Go. Everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him and he became captain over them. Uh, not the most stellar staff people. How would you like to start off a company with these kinds? You go, whoa, that's my kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we have to change that. And David took a rag tag mob of ruffians and turn them into the most elite militia fighters the world would ever see. In fact, they became known as the legendary David's 30 mighty men. Still known today by the people in Israel. And you think, how did that culture change from people being in debt and being discontented and, and, and people that are, are in distress and they become these elite leaders? He was someone who understood how to change a culture. Let me talk to those of you that are like David's today here in New Hope. You are veterans, maybe elders, but you're the culture makers or you could be the culture breakers. But I want to encourage you to be culture makers. You're the Moses generation. 
You are the thermostats, not the thermometers in this church. Your words, your encouragement or lack of encouragement, whether you see things up or down, makes a huge difference in this church. Your influence on the Joshua generation is stronger than you'll ever, ever realize. And if we abdicate our role as thermostats, if we abdicate that and just sit by passively, no wonder the Joshua generation becomes attracted to the world's culture and brings that in. We need to be culture setters. So you say, well, how do you change the culture in a church from the frozen chosen to the amazing and praisen? Don't get me going. I feel a rap starting in me again. You know. How do we change that? Well, let's take a look at how some people have done it in the past. You know, in the Japanese culture, they would have these large obelisks or stones. And, and when you enter a village, even walking to the village, village you'll see a stone on the side that kind of gives you some warnings or, or directions or even the character of the village you're going to. And then when you get to the village, it's not this picture, but it's like this. They might have two, three, four large stones as you enter the village. And on it would be written in kanji different words like heian, which means peace, or gamang, which means responsibility, or chikara, which means strength. So when you walk through these huge giants, these guardians, as it were, of this little village, you'll realize that the culture, identity of these people is that they honor peace, they honor responsibility, and they're people of great strength. And as you walk through, you say, this is who they are, huh? Yeah, that's who they are. In the European life, you would have the coat of arms or a crest. This is the Cordero crest here. You have, a, actually, this is my ancestors because the word Cordero means lamb or sheep. So they were probably shepherds or sheep herders in the past, but they were also great fighters when it came time for war. So that was on their crest. And so when they talk to their children, they say, this is who we are. This is our culture. But I think the most illustrative are the Eskimo. The Eskimo will have what they call totem poles. Have you heard of that? And the word totem means values. And that was their language because they had no written language. They had to tell people who they were. So in cities or rather in small villages or tribes, they would have these totem poles like silent megaphones. This is who we are. This is the kind of people we are. And so they would have these totem poles. So let me draw some for you. If one of the, uh, if one of the values was strength, then they would actually put a bear at the top. Not bad, huh? And so the bear would be at the top for strength. And then they would have, let's say, a salmon. I don't know how to draw that too well. So, so the next totem on the pole would be salmon. And then like maybe they would have a, oops, ooh, 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 an owl. And uh, it's a degeneration of artistry the lower I get. So, and then maybe at the bottom will be a fox. That's good enough. So, so then this would be a totem pole that would be in the village. And so if a young person would say, you know, I'm sick and tired of this village, sick and tired of this tribe. I want out of here. I'm sick and tired of the ice and the snow for months and months and months. I just am gone. I'm finished. And so an elder would sit him down next to this huge silent megaphone. And he would say, do you see that, son? Yeah. I've seen that since the day I was born. It's been here. Yeah. But you see, it's telling us who we are. Because you see at the top is a bear. Because that symbolizes strength. We as a people of this village must be strong. Because the winters are long. And it's easy to give up. We will not give up. Just like the second is a salmon. That will fight the cross currents. And the currents coming against it. And it will go upstream. 
so that it will continue its kind. We're like a salmon. And we're also like an owl. We need wisdom because we have people around us that may be hostile. But we've got to be wise and not just be hostile like them. We have to be wiser than that. And we have to be cunning like a fox because in the wintertime, there's not all of the foliage and all of the wildlife. We have to look for it, hunt for it. We've got to be cunning. Otherwise, we will not survive. This is who we are. This is who you are. It's inside of you. Be that. And he would say, oh, I got it. And in the Old Testament, it's the same thing. In the Old Testament, the Hebrews would actually put up stones, almost like the Asians. But this time, it would be whenever God would do something grand or a miracle would take place, they would build an altar of 12 stones, according to the tribes of Israel. And they would thank God, and they would move on, and God would do another miracle, and they'd put more stones. They'd thank God, and they'd move on. In fact, you could actually trace the Exodus route by following the stones, because that's what they would leave behind. And the scripture says this in the book of Joshua. There will be a time, it says, when it will be a time to come when your sons will ask, what do these stones mean? And you shall tell them of the mighty deeds of God who led us in the wilderness a cloud by day and a fire by night. This is who you are. You see, and all of a sudden, their identity starts coming back and they say, that is who we are. See, that's the kind of culture because we can forget in this topsy-turvy world who we are. We're ambassadors of heaven. But because we are frozen to the past events or a molestation or a problem or a hurt or an abuse, we're caught in that culture. But we need a place where as we move into our first anniversary where there's a foundational culture of healing, of wholeness, of life that takes place. So in the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about the kind of culture that we want to have. Remember, it doesn't happen just automatically. Listen, can I say this to your, the, 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 the fathers? You need to decide what kind of culture you want to have in your home. Don't leave it up to chance. If you do, you'll be pulling weeds, mark my words, for years to come because you didn't plan in the beginning. But if you know that you want orange seeds then you'll pull out all the weeds in advance when they're still young. If you don't know what you want to plant, you won't recognize the weeds until they've taken deep root. And then you need a backhoe to get them out. So it's so important, and the scripture talks about that, that God even establishes a culture among his people so that people would come. That's why in the book of Isaiah, in, in 5 and 6, it says... In the day of King Uzziah, I was in the temple of the Lord before his altar, and I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his glory filled the temple. What was he talking about? The kingdom of God. There's something so special about it. Well, how do we build that? I'm going to give you three totems of the New Hope totem pole. Among others, there's lots more, but let me just start with three, and here it is if you would write them down. And it's in your notes. You'll see a blank, and you can fill it in. The first totem on New Hope's totem pole that we value as a part of our culture, would you write it down? A culture of the second mile. Second mile. Oh, the scripture talks about that. It's pretty cool. Let's read it. It's up on the board. Would you read it with me? Out of Matthew 5 and verse 41. It's in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Let's read it. Go. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him you see, under the Roman occupation, when Jesus came, they could force, a centurion could force any Jew to carry his backpack for a mile. It was mandated. And the Roman mile was calculated by 1,000 steps. But today, we use the British statute mile. It's, a, it's about 100 yards longer. But in the Roman times, a mile was actually a thousand steps. And so they would actually have road markers every thousand steps. So if you were there, he would throw his pack at you and say, carry it to the next marker. And you were mandated to carry it. Now, most Jewish people would carry it with, with anger, bitterness, 
mad, complaining all the way. And at the end, they would throw that backpack down and say, there. But Jesus said, I want you to go a second mile. What? Yeah. What Jesus was saying in the Sermon on the Mount is this. The first mile is the mandated mile. But if you have a heart to go the second mile, we call that the miracle mile. That's where the miracles take place. The miracle mile is what separates. See, the first mile is the have to. The second mile is the get to. And that's where the miracles take place. That's where things start to happen. I'm thankful for that God has given us so many second milers here at the church. I mean, before you arrive today, this morning at about 8 a.m., there was a host of people praying over every chair here, praying for you, your family, your health, your blessing, laid hands on every chair in this place. They didn't have to come that early, but they did. See, that's second mile, people. Oh, they come at nine. That's when I'm supposed to come and I'll leave as soon as it's over. No, we're going to come early and we're going to stay late. See, first mile is sort of the mandated mile. Second mile is the miracle mile. If you would think about this, God often asks you to move beyond your comfort zone. And that's how you grow. That's how you enlarge. If we stay at the first mile, we maintain. You move into the miracle mile, and that's when you expand. That's when you grow. That's where the miracles take place. In fact, would you write this down in your notes somewhere? Write it down. God's best will always be beyond your comfort zone. God's best will always be found beyond your comfort zone. Don't use God to enhance your comfort zone. God may want to press you beyond that. Somebody said it this way, the truth will set you free, but first, it might just make you miserable. <laughs> and then you expand beyond your first mile, now you're in the second mile, and that's the miracle mile. See, a lot of times people say, well, I have to do this, so I'll just do this. I have to do that. Is it required? Is it mandated? Okay, I'll do it. And the Lord says, I want you to live beyond that because the miracles happen in the second mile. And if we're not second mile people, that's why we never see it. See, a lot of times we want the benefits of the second mile without even having done the first. And so God calls us beyond that in our marriages. Well, I guess I have to do this, don't I? I guess I got to do this, huh? So, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, complete the first mile, but move into the second. Because the first is the mandated mile. The second mile is the miracle mile. I'm grateful for the second milers we have. I mean, I came in early this morning, and Jana Bruns was up over there making coffee, and Helen was getting things ready. Jamie is upstairs vacuuming, com comes early, and vacuums and I thought wow the safety team and Tom and Rick and so many others Keone comes up early and puts in these uh, signs up front and that just doesn't happen automatically by accident it's intentional but these are second mile people and I think ah all of the things that you see around you are because of second milers I thought Lord that's where you work isn't it second mile I want to encourage, invite you to be a part of the second mile. I applaud the second milers, and so does heaven. But that's a way to develop the culture in your marriage, in your home. Would you write down the second is this, and that's the culture of encouragement. The culture of encouragement. Oh, I love Hebrews 3.13. It says something almost cryptic. It says this. Therefore, encourage one another... While it's still called today, lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I thought, what in the world are you talking about? Continue to encourage one another lest you be hardened? What do you mean? And then I began to understand. You see, there's, there's people doing so much stuff. And, and, and if, if they're not encouraged, it's easy to have a, get a hardened heart. I mean, I'm just working hard. I come early for church and I do this and I do that. Nobody even notices whether I'm here or not. Nobody sends me a thank you note. Nobody says great job, nothing. And after a while, the heart just slowly starts to harden. And then we say, I'm, I'm done. If they don't appreciate me, I'm done. But what if in the midst of that, just eventuating hardening, 
just ever so slowly hardening, someone comes and encourages. Thank you. Gosh, that was so good. It softens their heart. Therefore, encourage one another while it's still called today, lest any of those hearts start to get hardened. Before it gets hardened, encourage, encourage, encourage. And you know what it does? It actually stirs and, and promotes second milers. It keeps our hearts soft for the things of the kingdom of God. And also, it has to do with authority. When you encourage somebody, I want you to know that God says that is the inception, the genesis of a greater authority that I will give to a church. You say, well, what are you talking about? You, you see, we need authority. I mean, it's not something to be afraid of. I know it's been misused and abused in so many ways that we see in the media and, and in our leadership. But listen, the original meaning of authority is a Greek word, exousia, which actually means the power to influence and change the future of and determine things for the good or for the bad. You choose. But it's like dunamis, and you shall receive power. That word in the book of Acts is where we get the word dynamite from. It can be used for construction or for destruction. But that's that word authority. Now, why does God want the church to have authority? I'll tell you why. Because there's only one group on the face of this earth that has authority over the darkness of hell. And it's not the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. It's the church of the living God. Amen. Can you say amen to that? Amen. It's you and me. Because the Bible says the gates of hell cannot prevail against us. So God gives you authority. Why? To say, get thee behind me, Satan. 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. But if you don't take that authority, he will breach it. I don't know if it's a true story, but I heard this story where in the 40s, a man went into a bank and asked the, the clerk to give him all the money in her drawer. Put it in this bag. She put it in the bag he quickly left. Later on, he was apprehended by the police. But in court, the judge had to let him go free. Why? Because he said, your honor, I didn't brandish a weapon. I didn't threaten her. I didn't yell at her. I just gave her a paper bag and said, could you put the money in your drawer in this bag? She did. All she had to say was no. She gave it to me. You shouldn't indict me. You should indict her. And the judge said, you mean you had no weapon? No. You didn't threaten her? No. I just asked politely. And she complied. He said, okay. Clark, you shouldn't do that. You see, if we got the authority yet we don't use or exercise it, the devil will trample all over us. God gives us authority because we need to stand against the gates of hell. How many of us are getting run over by the enemy? Why? Not because we can't. It's because we don't use our authority. I had a guy come to me in church some time ago, and he said, Pastor Wayne, man, I had to, I, I, I had to come and talk, talk, talk to you. I said, about what? He said, man, I was sleeping some time ago, and like weird stuff started happening in my living room. Like the, the enemy was coming after me. So I said, so what'd you do? He said, I moved to the living room. I said, you what? Yeah, I sleep in the living room. I said, uh, and then what? He said, well, a few nights later, weird things started happening in the living room. So I said, so what'd you do? He said, I sleep in the kitchen now. I said, why didn't you stand up against the devil? Because if you don't, you'll be sleeping in the bathtub pretty soon. He's going to run you all over your house. Greater is he who is in you. Then he who was in the world, 1 John 4, 4. For this reason was the Son of God manifest that he might destroy the works of the evil one. For the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. And you need to take that authority. Oh, okay, he said. You see, authority is given to us because it helps us to destroy the deeds of the darkness. On the other hand, watch this. On the side of the light, he says, I'll give you authority to encourage people. What? Yeah, because if a person of great authority encourages, it, it gives a future and a hope. 
if a person of authority uses it incorrectly and misuses it and abuses it, it can alter their future for bad. And I will give you more authority if you will use it correctly. But if you will abuse authority, then I will take what you have. So you may be left with a position, but with no authority, no respect, and no integrity. And that's what you see around us today because of the misuse of authority. So you say, well, what are you talking about? Paul the Apostle addresses this in two places in the book of 2 Corinthians. He says something, and when he repeats something twice, that means there's an exclamation point on it. The first he's going to talk about is authority on both sides of the spectrum. Tough side, but also good side. Let's read it. It'll come up on the board. And would you read this with me out of 2 Corinthians? Are you ready? Go. So even if I boast somewhat freely about the the Lord gave me. Here it is for rather than I will not be ashamed. Why did he give him authority for and not? Yeah, see, a lot of times we misuse our authority. It's like, I, you know, you know who I am? Yeah, I need my own parking spot. Yeah, I need you to give me a little bit more favor here. Do you know who you're talking to? Do you know who I am? And we use our authority for personal favors instead of serving and protecting. And the story of this lady, she comes into a church and, and it's the first time the usher's seen her. And, and so he said, hi, uh, uh, ma'am, where would you like to sit? She said, I'd like to sit right in front of the preacher. He said, oh, you don't want to do that. She said, why? He said, because the preacher's super boring and you might fall asleep. And that doesn't look good when you're on the front row. She said, do you know who I am? Usher said, no. She said, I'm the pastor's mother. <laughs> and the usher said, do you know who I am? She said, no. He said, good. And he ran off. <laughs> <laughs> so how many times we misuse our authority? Do you know who I am? But Paul addresses this again in 2 Corinthians 13. Almost verbatim, he repeats himself just to emphasize. And he says it this way. And it's coming up on the board. Read it with me. Go. The authority the Lord gave me for and not for. Again, he says that. So you say, well, what are you talking about? You see, the culture is so dependent on people using authority correctly, not incorrectly, not for personal favor, favors, but for building up that culture of people in that culture. That's what this is, the church, not for tearing down, because we can become legalistic, we could become stodgy, we become demanding, or we can build up. And people are, who are frozen because of past hurts will come into this place, and if we then demean them more, like, oh, no, no, no. we got to bring life, bring life. Let's say a little girl, Sally, comes to a talent show, and she's supposed to share a scripture, and so she's so nervous, and she says to her friend, I'm so nervous. She says, go, Sally, you can do it. I'm so nervous. Go, okay. And so with quivering voice, this is my scripture, John 15, 16. You have not chosen me, saith the Lord, but I have chosen you and appointed you that he, you should go forth and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. And she runs down to her seat and her friend goes, good job, Sally. Oh, I'm so nervous. <laughs> but just then, let's say a, a pastor comes who has great authority and he bends down in front of her and says, Sally, can I share this with you? Oh, yes, pastor. Um, thank you for memorizing that because... That is a scripture that spoke so much to me. You see, sometimes I, I forget that God chose me. I didn't choose him. He loved me so much that he chose me and appointed me that I should be fruitful. I forget that so many times and I get discouraged. Your words tonight just prophetically spoke to my heart. Thank you. Thank you. More than you'll ever know. Thank you. <gasps> Thank you, Pastor. That little girl can go six months on that encouragement. Why? Because it came from someone of? Ah. You see, when there is a friend that doesn't have that much authority, maybe has some peer friendship, good job, Sally. Oh, that's good. But when authority is used correctly, not to tear down, but to? 
changes that girl's future. Let me tell you a story where it changed mine. When I came to this college, I was about 20 years old, and, and I came out of rock and roll. I played music up in Portland, and so I sang and played guitar. And, and uh, we would sing at, uh, on Division Street. There was a big hall, dance hall, and, and uh, we'd have huge Marshall speakers behind us, and we'd play and sing. And, and most of the time, everyone, you know, like, is stoned or drunk, so, like, you can play terrible. And they go, yeah, yeah, that's so cool, you know. So we just kind of go for it. Well, I get saved, and I come to this college, and the president says, hey, Wayne, we're going to have a pastor's conference in about six months in Iowa. Can I take you with me, and you do a song or two for the conference? I said, whoa, okay. And so six months comes, and I go to this classic church with white columns. I mean, it's just spiring columns. And you go in, and man, there's these really respectful pastors, all white hair, and you know, ladies with bouffants and seersucker suits, the guys have, and they're sitting there. And it was my turn to go up and sing. And usually there's a lot of noise in the dance hall where I used to play, but this one's like super quiet. And I thought, oh, they can hear every mistake. And so all of a sudden, I got so nervous, all the moisture in my mouth drained into my hands, and I forgot the first line of the, the song, and I had to make it up, kind of like that rap, and I just made something up. When it was done, it was terrible, by the way. So everybody gives me this courtesy clap. And I sat down on the front row, and I made a vow. I said, when the speaker's done speaking, I'm going to grab my guitar from the stage, put it in away, away in its case, and I'm leaving. No, 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 not just the conference, the Bible college. Because if I cannot share my testimony with these who are already convinced, how in the world am I going to share it with a world that is yet to be convinced? I'm a sham. So the speaker was done. I got my guitar, put it in its case, and I was ready to bolt out the door when I felt this big hand on my shoulder. And it was a pure white-haired pastor of this venerable church. He grabbed me and he said, have a seat, son. And I thought, oh, snap. <laughs> I'm dead. He's going to tell me I ruined his conference. So he said, you were nervous tonight, weren't you, son? I said, yes, sir, I was. He said, you wanted to run, didn't you? I said, yes, sir, I really did. I wanted to run. He said, but you didn't. I said, no, but I should have had, didn't I? I should have gotten so sorry. He said, no, no, you didn't run. You finished it. You stayed right there and finished it. I said, yes, sir, I apologize. He said, no, no, you didn't run. You want to know why? You want to know why? I said, yeah, please tell me because I have no idea. He said, I'll tell you why. You didn't leave. You finished it. Why? Because you, you honor God. And love God more than you love men's applause. You stayed there for the name and the sake of Jesus. And you stuck it out. He said, you know how many times I want to run? I said, no, sir. He said, every Monday when I'm done preaching, I want to leave. But I won't now. I said, why? He said, because I'll always remember a Bible college student that stuck it out till the end no matter what. And then he said this, you keep singing, you keep praising, you keep worshiping, you keep preaching. You understand me? I said, yes, sir. He said, because God's going to use you. I said, yes, sir, yes, sir. And I look back on it now, and I think I'm probably in the ministry today, 48 years later. I'm still in the ministry today because one man uses authority correctly. He could have used it to tear one down, but instead he used it to build up, and it changed my future. Change altered it. Do you understand? That's the kind of culture God wants, and that's why he says encourage, a culture of encouragement. And then God gives us more authority if we use it the way that he's asked us to. Fathers, listen, you get to use your authority with your children to build them up because inside that seed is life. But if the culture is bad, that'll be frozen. And it'll never come alive until you change the culture. And all of a sudden, what God has programmed becomes something in, a reality. And your authority is able to do that. You build that culture. And so if we use our authority for our own use, brothers, can I say this? Use your authority to protect the sisters, not take advantage of them. 
Even if there's a weak sister and you can take advantage of her morally, don't do it. Protect her. Use your authority correctly. And God will honor that and give you even more in the future. And your future will be bright. Think through that. And be men of great authority. Oh, God has no problem giving you tons more authority if we will use it correctly against the powers of hell and to build up the Joshua generation. Amen, amen, amen. 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 So it's a culture of encouragement. And finally, would you write down a culture of the heart? A culture of the heart. Where we live heart first. I tell our ushers, don't hand out bulletins with your hands. Hand them out with your heart. Don't wipe the tables with a washcloth. Use your heart. Put heart in everything you do. Because even in a church like this, a mind can reach a mind, but only a heart can reach a heart. And God wants to reach people's hearts. So we have to serve him with all our... Yeah, let's read what the scripture says in Colossians. Would you read it? Go. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as though you were working for the Lord. In the beginning, when we started New Hope in Hawaii, we, all we had was heart. We didn't even have chairs. We rented a cafeteria. And if you were on the coffee crew, you had to bring your own coffee pot and your own coffee because we had nothing. If you were going to help sweep the floor, you had to bring your own broom from home. We had those cafeteria tables where the benches folded up on the top. We didn't have chairs, so we put one side down and lined them all up, and that's what people sat on. I remember after about the second week, we decided to start taking offerings, and we took our first offering. It was $550. We went to Costco, bought chairs. And so this next week, I said, do you know the offering we took last week? You know where, where it is? I said, you're sitting on it. <laughs> all the instruments had to be brought in, all of the sound systems. Everybody had to bring their own stuff. The drummer had to put drums in his car, bring it, set it up, take it down, take it home. But we had heart. Oh, we'd have like eight people on both sides of the door where people would come in, and we'd hug people. By the time they got through us, they'd been hugged by 16 people. Yeah, it was just, it was a gauntlet of huggers. Yeah, first of all, we hugged them because we were surprised anybody would even come to church. <laughs> so we became known as the hugging church. We would hug everything within 10 feet of us, <laughs> just for good measure. But you know, God grew it and grew it and grew it, and people came to Christ more and more. And when we left just a few years ago, we had counted up 240,000 first-time decisions for Christ that had been made over the last X amount of years. And I thought, it all started with heart, didn't it, Lord? Because without heart, he can't do anything. We want to be a people of a heart for the second mile. And once we have that kind of heart, God says, I got pretty much everything I need. Here we go. Just put on your seatbelt for the ride. Do it with all your heart. When you worship, worship with all your heart. When you serve, all your heart. Let's do it with all our heart. A culture of living heart first. The same is true in your marriage, your family, your business. Do it with all your heart. If not, change your heart and do it with all your heart. Let me finish with a story uh, of heart. When we started in an <clears throat> auditorium, this man... I'd never seen him before, came and sat on the very front row and he crossed his arms like this and just scowled at me the whole service. It was really distracting. And so I just tried not to look at him, but it's hard when he's like right there, you know. And so I finished and boy, it was really hard to speak. And, and so when it was done, he left. And I thought, well, praise the Lord, he's gone. And, uh, but the next week he came back again, sat in the same seat, crossed his arms with a scowl. So I thought, I'm going to win him over. I'm going to tell, you know, my best you know, dog and pony kind of jokes and, and uh, just see if I can get him to crack a smile. Never cracked a smile. So after the service was done, I thought, whoo, gone. And uh, I went straight to prayer. Lord, help him to go to the Baptist church somewhere, <laughs> any kind of church. And uh, third week, he shows up again. And so I thought, oh, Lord, this is so difficult. 
So after church was the last service, he went out and mingled with some people. And I was talking to some people by the back door. And here he comes and he gets in line. And so he kind of works his way up to the front. And I said, well, well, hello. And he said, uh, I just wanted you to know that I'm going to make New Hope my home church. I said, wonderful. I am just thrilled. You could see it on my, I'm starting to tear up already. And he, he said, well, it, it wasn't about you. I said, thank you. I feel so good. You know. He said, but I, after church, I went to the back and wanted to see if people really lived what they were learning. So I guess he was talking with some of the college students. And he said this, he said, and I didn't know when I was done, I backed up and there was a ledge off the cement sidewalk that I didn't see about six inches. And I, I stumbled and I started stumbling backward and I couldn't catch myself. And behind me was a brick wall a stone wall, and I was going head first towards it, and right before I hit, this college kid throws himself in between, and I fall on him. Intentionally, he does this, and rips his back open on this rock wall. And he then helps me up, and I look at his shirt, and it's all torn. And he said, sir, are you okay? I said, are you okay? He said, oh, I'm fine. I, I, it, this made my day that I was able to serve you in this way. He said, what? Yeah, that the Lord had me this close that I could be there for you so you wouldn't injure yourself. And this man looked at me and said, that's the kind of heart I want to have. I don't have that kind of heart. I want to have that kind of heart. And so this is going to be my home church, maybe. One day I'll have half that kind of heart. And I thought, you know, a mind can reach a mind, but only a heart can reach a heart. And so we want to have a culture of living heart first, a culture of encouragement, a culture of the second mile, a culture of the heart. And when God sees that, he'll give you all the authority you need. If we'll wield it correctly, You'll see the future bright, the Joshua generation rise, and God be glorified. I want that to be us. Can you say amen and agree with me? Amen. amen. Let's stand together.